Welcome back, everyone. Captain Foley and Commander Cockings are back yet again. How excited are you all? I think we're really excited. That's all, good. all one of us who's here that isn't you. <laughs> it's time for another Trek Yards announcement. We love sharing the world of Trek with you all, and that includes incredibly talented people responsible for fan-created productions. And today we have with joining us one of the ones that I'm looking forward to. Uh, Samuel, do you want to tell us who's joining us today? Well, that would be the man behind the high-anticipated Pacific Tour 1. So welcome, Mr. Eric Henry. Hi. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning, I guess. How long have you been a Star Trek fan, and uh, perhaps what was your first Star Trek memory? I've been a Star Trek fan forever. Um, no, as long feeling. as I can remember. Yeah. yeah um, I was introduced to it at some point in my youth, and... I, I can't really remember my earliest Star Trek memory, but I know it was TOS because that was my dad's favorite. And when he introduced Star Trek to me and my brother, it was TOS. We did watch TNG as children as well and the movies, obviously. But <clears throat> TOS was was where it was at. Yeah, I've been told my first episode was Corbin Light Maneuver, apparently. So that was oh, it's a good told. first episode. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us a little about Pacific 201, the universe, the era... And even the ship. And go. <laughs> well, uh, Pacific 201 takes place in 2200 on the dot. Um, it's So that's pretty much almost exactly halfway between Enterprise and TOS. Um, maybe a little closer to Enterprise, I think. Um, or maybe, yeah, I think it's a little closer to Enterprise. But um, it, 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 it kind of assumes different assumptions about that interim period. Um, there's really nothing canonical that takes place between those those two points in time. So there's a lot of flexibility there. I know there are novels, the Romulan War novels and, and such. And then there's the uh, Federation first 150 years, which is great. But um, I disagree with some of the assumptions that book makes, even yeah. though it's, it's really good reading. Um, so Pacific 201 kind of assumes a different world where uh, Starfleet after the war is much more militarized and you know after the nx01 is sent out the only thing that happens from the public's perspective is seven million people get killed by the zindi and countless more get killed by the romulans so <clears throat> from a public relations standpoint space exploration all it does is kill people um <clears throat> so starfleet after the war is we are keeping humanity safe. Mm. It's not a, we are exploring and doing cool, you know, cooperative stuff with other species. Like there is a Federation, but Pacific 201 kind of assumes more that the Federation is more of a security thing rather than like a, let's explore the stars together kind of thing, um, <clears throat> which it does become, but um, we're thinking with Pacific 201, it's a little more realistic to think that, Earth and humanity needs recovery time. Um, a lot of people, even still alive during Pacific 201, had friends and family members mm. killed by either the Zindi or the Romulans. So there's there's still an atmosphere of space is kind of dangerous, and we need Starfleet to keep us safe, not exploring. Still that last conservative step, that last bit of let's get our, let's get everything under control ready before that jump into exploration, as it were. Right, so Pacific 201, the, the Starship Pacific, is like the first step back into that world where we, you know, exploration and, you know, peaceful cooperation. Like, now, after 40 years of recovery time, Earth is like, all right, we can try this again. You know, there, there's a new generation who's kind of eager to get out of this kind of cold and backwards uh, culture that's mm -hmm. kind of fearful so there's there's a message to Pacific 201 about overcoming, you know, fear and uh, prejudice and stuff like that. But you mentioned the ships right away, Pacific. Got to say, it's probably one of the most intriguing fan designs out there for a fan film. So tell us about the inspiration for this design and how long it's actually been around. Was it something you maybe had in your head for a good decade and now you can finally bring to life? Or was it like, snap of the fingers, that just works on a napkin as Johnny sometimes does? <laughs> well, it... Somewhere in between, I guess, um, the the actual literal design for the Pacific is only two years old, I think. Mm. Um, when I first considered the story of Pacific 201, I was imagining it, firstly, more of a Kirk-era 
thing. Mm-hmm. And secondly, the idea was more like a Kirk era galaxy class. So it was a massive ship. Mm. I had this idea that, you know, it was a similar kind of message. Obviously the political and social structure was different, but it was like, we're sending out this awesome new ship. And it was kind of like eclipsing the enterprise. Like, so a uh, Kelvin sized, you know, the Kelvin class. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like it was kind of eclipsing the enterprise and that would be kind of part of the story. Like oh, pff, who cares about Kirk? Like this is where it's at. <laughs> so th- there'd be like a, like a subtle kind of jab in there with this massive new ship going out. But as I started developing the story, I thought it'd be much more interesting if there were like a kind of a, a darker past it was coming out of, and there was more of a message there. So I, I set it in the interim period between the series and I changed the ship to a more military ship. So I started looking at destroyers and I started looking at um, uh, like NASA spacecraft because mm. I wanted it to be a lot more rudimentary so um, if you look at the Pacific, um, like it, it has elements of a Navy destroyer. It has like uh, dorsal missile hatches on it, and it has like a big mast and a little flying bridge and everything like <clears throat> those those ship elements. And then the little nitty gritties are very uh, NASA esque. Like I've actually lifted literal details from the International Space Station onto the Pacific. So those are some inspirations that are there, too. Yeah, we see a lot of other new tech in your promotional trailers and such. So can you please tell us a little bit about the new things you've invented for your universe? Well, we haven't invented much. I mean, we've redesigned things. Mm. For instance, let me see if I can grab it right here. Um, I didn't need to take my headphones off. Like, we've redesigned the phaser, Mm. which is much more... uh, gun ish and and s- some people have taken offense to that i guess but again it's kind of going with the more militarized starfleet where like we really wanted it to look like a gun but well, it does it, have it's fine it's a prequel to the laser from cage it's... yeah it works right th- there there are there are actually some cage elements yeah. that are very subtle like this front part is octagonal like in profile and we kind of wanted that to be reminiscent of like the circular cylinder part of the the, the cage laser, and then, of course, the TOS phaser mm-hmm. uh, duck tail or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's that. And <clears throat> we have kind of devolved some of the technology. Um, not that I don't like Enterprise, but I felt like Enterprise kind of introduced some things a little too quickly. Mm-hmm. Phasers being a major one, transporters another one. Um, they could have those things, but I felt like maybe we should have only had torpedoes in an enterprise and how much more interesting the stories might've been if they were limited in that way, they couldn't just fire off phasers or beam people. So we're not retconning that, but we're presenting phasers and transporters as a novel technology in Pacific 201. Um, Sort of how I feel that the original series kind of did that in a very subtle way. Like, you know, with McCoy being, wary of the transporter Mm. and stuff like that like it still felt like a new technology even though like well who would be wary of the transporter after you know a hundred years of use and i know they they brought it back in tng with barkley but we are we are making the world a little more rudimentary um mostly for storytelling i I feel like it makes for more interesting storytelling when the characters are limited and you could probably just say you can't find as much dilithium so you can't run the reactors as much so you can't use the power to generate the phases and therefore you can't use the phases as much and there you go yeah, you yeah, More there are need need to have need to infinite yeah. infinite solutions for that sort of go. thing. Yeah, but yeah. So, um, how long has this entire production taken you so far, and where would you say you were now? Well, it has taken about two years. Um, when I say like the the ship as we understand it is about two years old, mm. I started designing that ship when I really had a good solid idea for the story, um, which I feel like that comforts some people who are afraid that. You know, we've been showing so many visuals for Pacific 201, but we haven't shown a lot of story and character. Mm. And that's chiefly because it's really hard to share that sort of thing. And secondly, because the story is very easy to spoil. Mm. So um, we've been very hesitant in sharing, but um, the story really did come first. And it, I worked on the story for months before I even started making like the the visuals and stuff like that though i did draw the ship very early on there i think there are some some concept art 
pictures on the Facebook page where it shows like preliminary sketches um, of the Pacific and a few like rejected designs. Cool. But it's been about two years since I started working on the story. And um, as it, as it comes now, at this point, we're right on the cusp of ending pre-production. Um, I, we're, we're still yet to cast actors or hold auditions and that's a huge step. So that's kind of why it hasn't really happened yet, but we are going to be contacting acting talent bases around the area and actually holding auditions for the parts. So it's not just whoever I could find, you know, I want to really cast people who are right for the roles yeah. because the characters are really important in this, in this, like, um, in, in a way that is a little different for Star Trek because Star Trek tends to be an ensemble cast. Like there's not really a main character in a typical episode. Like there might be some character centric episodes, but you typically have, everyone has a lot of screen time. Pacific 201 has a main character. And so it's a little different because the whole movie takes place from the point of view of our science officer rather than like everybody like, because there's kind of barriers between some of the characters. So it's not like everyone sits around a table and talks mm. like they're, you're, you're not sure what everyone's up to when we're off with our science officer doing something. We don't know what the captain and the first officer are doing necessarily that sort of thing. So it's really important that we have a really strong lead firstly. And then each character really needs to be strong by themselves because they don't, it's not like a group so often. Well, I've got to say, I love how, clearly you've thought it through but we don't want to save the extra detail for the full episodes it's just the introduction video <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind how has fan reaction been to your trailers and just the initial concept yeah that i was kind of expecting a little more pushback i mean we, we've gotten some pushback but like i've been pretty open about stuff that we're doing like redesigning certain things and like reassuming new things mm -hmm. about about the universe like the fact that the Federation wasn't immediately like one big happy fleet, that sort of thing. And I, I expected a little more reaction to that, but people generally seem pretty on board with the idea. And I've had some people say that that's the selling point for them. Like, Oh, I really like this new assumption about the world. Like mm -hmm. it's not immediately a utopia and that sort of thing. Like, some people really like that. And some people do say like, well, it's like an alternate universe and they're okay with that. I, I don't think it's a, an alternate universe, um, but it is different from many expectations of the universe. Though but it, it doesn't, but it it's doesn't fair actually... to say though, canon is still canon for you. Right. It does. I don't break. I try not to break canon. Um, there are some things that I feel are kind of soft, like, well, the treaty between the Romulans and the humans was unbroken until balance of terror. And it's like, well, define unbroken, you know, that sort of thing. Like Romulans are in this story, but are any treaties broken? Officially <laughs> unbroken as far right. as the public knows. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> cool. All right. Well, that's it for this announcement video, guys. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today, Eric. It's exciting to have you on board as it were. I, for one, am very much looking forward to seeing your film and learning more about what makes your universe tick and for fleshing out all these new additions to the world of Star Trek. We will, of course, be having more episodes with Eric down the road, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, guys, that's it. Um, we are excited for 201 to be joining us, and we will see you all very soon. Until then, this is Team Trek Yards, signing off until next time. Bye, guys. Bye.